You're listening to The Dating Den with dating and relationship badass and best-selling author, Marnie Batista. Every week, you'll get the raw truth from top experts and real people on the important dating, sex, and relationship issues you want to know about. So if you're ready for true talk that's authentic and unfiltered, and you're not afraid to be called out on your <clears throat> stuff, then you're ready for what's next. The Dating Den, episode 64 with Dr. Sheldon Cardner. He's back. Dr. Cardner shares how to go from knowing your issues to changing your life. Ladies, welcome back into my very cozy dating den today. Um, you know, this uh, this thing we do here, this little show, gets a lot of listeners and we get a lot of feedback. And one of the most helpful shows we ever did was with a great guy, um, my my therapist crush, Dr. Sheldon Cardner. And uh, we had so much amazing feedback from this episode that I had to search him down and invite him back into the den. So before I uh, do our little bio and all of that, I just want to say thank you for coming back, Dr. Cardner. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So it's so great. So let me tell you, if you haven't heard that episode, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Cardner. So uh, he is brilliant, and his whole sort of philosophy goes something like this. You know, like from the beginning of our lives, uh, we all have these behaviors, these behavioral patterns um, and emotional expectations from our relationships that we have, especially with significant others. And it, it shapes the way we function. And so over time, these experiences that once worked well especially as we get out in the world, start to lead to undesired outcomes. And the early solutions that we form may later become problems that we have. And that's kind of one of the paradoxes of life and trying to be a grown-up, especially when you want to have a healthy, intimate relationship. And Dr. Cardner uh, has this amazing process he created called Focus Dynamic Therapy. And he works with clients to identify those earlier threads uh, that have become woven into the fabric of our present lives. And the process that he created really allows the, him, the therapist, and then the patient to express in ordinary language an understanding of the problems that they're having, the, the formulation, the dynamic formulation with which they were created, um, and actually then creates an alliance in working toward resolving this kind of once and for all. And Dr. Cardner is an MD. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science in mechanical engineering, um, and then subsequently a doctor from the School of Medicine with honors um, Alpha, what's Alpha Omega Alpha, which sounds impressive, at Wayne State University. And then he did a psychiatric residency at UCLA, joined the faculty, and he's now a clinical professor professor of psychiatry. Wow, I'd love to have you as my professor. Uh, I think that'd be an amazing class. He has written extensively. He's practiced psychodynamic psychotherapy with a special interest in couples therapy. He also teaches mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nurses, uh, marriage and family therapists, as well as lay groups. And he uh, has a book called Breaking Free, which we highly recommend. And he distills these experiences and really shares his unique approach to understanding how emotional conflicts develop and, and can be treated. And so, you know, this is a book that I read probably now a couple of years ago that was literally a game changer in my own life and, and a lot of how we work with our clients. And um, it's brilliant. So the, I think, you know, we have to kind of catch people up if they haven't listened to the first episode. So if you could just give us an overview, you know, about these these chains that we have to our past and how they impact um, our ability to be in truly healthy, intimate relationships. Yeah, well, your summary was phenomenal. <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, you really captured the essence uh, in your description. And uh, what I would, uh, in response to what you just asked me, what came to mind is a, a story I heard that was actually true of a uh, Coast Guardman who was on a rescue mission, and they pulled a survivor who had been at sea for some period of time uh, out of the water, and the only way he survived was to hold on to the detritus from the wrecked ship. Uh, he just clung to a uh, some something that floated, whatever the nature of that uh, leftover wreck piece was, uh, and that's the only thing that kept him alive was clinging desperately to that uh, object. And when they pulled him onto the ship... And he was then safe. 
they practically had to pry that piece of wood out of his arms. He would not let go of it. Wow. And I think that's a powerful image that, that it certainly impressed me, not only in terms of the, the literal truth of the experience, but the metaphoric aspect of how we cling to what saved us once, and that even though it's no longer needed, we still cling desperately to it as if our life depended on it. So that image is one that came to my mind in response to what you asked. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So one of the things that that I think is brilliant about this and that analogy is great is that often we're clinging to the that wreckage and we don't actually even know that it's wreckage, right? Like it's so familiar. It's a pattern that we've done over and over again. So how can, like, what's a first step to realize that those behavior patterns, that clinging um, is, is something that is old, right? It's just, it's wreckage, um, and that it's not serving us. Right. I think the, the important thing to recognize is that uh, the those uh, characteristics or experiences that we had as children that are constructive and productive get internalized in a constructive fashion. So that, for example, a, a child raised in a family that is ethical and honest and straightforward in their dealings with others and respectful of others as well as expecting respect, incorporate that in their adult selves, and that's how they operate without the conflict. So what we're referring to when we talk about chains going back that hold us to something that was not constructive and not helpful uh, is the fact that it, it, uh, it begins to have problems in our relationships. We begin to develop a, a, a glitch in the way we function as adults. Now, we may recognize that glitch and struggle with it in terms of I know that something that I'm doing uh, is not optimizing what I can have in a relationship, yet I find myself doing it. Or we may be unaware of it and others bring it to our attention. So uh, it becomes a matter of the dysfunction. If there's no dysfunction, we may not be aware of it. There may be a problem, but if we have incorporated our in our life a dysfunction such that we're totally unaware of it, others can see us operating at less than optimum way, and yet we ourselves may be blind to it. So it depends a lot on either self-awareness, hey, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not really operating as well or uh, as fully as I could, or others bring it to our attention and we pay attention to what they say. That's so important. And I want, like, listen, rewind, hit the little 15-second bucket button, button because what Dr. Gardner said, the way he even framed it, is so helpful rather than shaming, right? Like, I'm not showing up as well as I could in my relationships rather than, you know, I'm so effed up. I'm so, what's wrong with me? I'm so broken, right? Like, it's something that when you're aware of it, Dr. Gardner, you can start to shift it, yes? It's not like genetic or you're destined or you, you know, you're just meant to be, you know, broken. Right. You you can't solve a problem that isn't stated or recognized. And uh, yes, there are people who go through life. Uh, I, I once saw a, uh, go through, uh, let me finish that, <laughs> that hagged uh, sentence, uh, uh, that is go through life far less optimally than they could. And I once saw a, um, a church sign, it was on the corner of, uh, that I had to turn the corner to get to my office, and uh, the pastor of that church was known, I had patients who went to that church, and they told me what a phenomenal omelist of uh, sermon giver he was, and uh, I could believe it in terms of the the uh, sermon's title that was on the church announcement outside in the corner, and I passed it every day, and that this particular Sunday sermon caught me. What if I awake before I die? What a profound mm-hmm. statement. You don't have to listen to the sermon. What if I awake before I die? And there are many people who go through their life sound asleep uh, and far less than in an optimal state. Or if they recognize it, 
they close their eyes and pretend they didn't uh, pay attention or or respond to it uh, because it is in some ways easier to run on that kind of uh, this is the way it's always been done this is the way we do it this is the way we'll continue to do it wow that's that's really beautiful so so let's kind of take that, that to the next to the next uh, level which is some of our listeners, you know, they've gone to therapy, they read the book, right? They have the t-shirt and they can say, oh, well, my dad wasn't available when I was younger. So therefore I know I attract unavailable men or I, you know, I've read all this stuff about attachment and I have blah, blah, blah attachment. So they know it, but that doesn't resolve it. So why, why can't you resolve something just because you know it? Yeah, we circle back then to what I said initially about the uh, survivor in the ocean. Uh, as long as we feel that what script we had as kids, and I like the idea of thinking of a script, uh, what script we had as, as, as kids, though we recognize it was not optimum, without it we're orphans, that we've lost our home, or what we recognize as a way of surviving, just like that survivor grasping this piece of driftwood that kept him alive. So it's the emotional investment in the script that I hate it, or as I've once uh, joked that uh, a, a very popular sampler that could hang over most people's homes is be it ever so miserable, there's no place like home. Mm. And it is true that we can acknowledge that it may be miserable, but we don't know what else could possibly replace it. And without it, we have that profound existential angst that we've lost our home, that we are orphans, that we've lost our way of being in the world. So for people who uh, often take that script and decide, we'll just cast a new lead in the role. Is very much like taking Hamlet. If you don't like it as a tragedy, well, then cast a new lead in the role. And when the curtain falls of the last act, you know what? It's still a tragedy. Mm. It's not until we get rid of the script that we then can have what we would like. And it's getting rid of that script that is profound step because it's the connection like the driftwood that we feel has kept us alive even though the reality is we're now on the coast guard ship safe wow that when you said that in our last episode you talked about um you know you have to orphan yourself and i actually had a client who had listened to that episode and she um had her mother pass away when she was really young and she was like you know i just keep having like this reaction i keep getting triggered um and she had said you know like i unless i orphan myself from this story this experience right of that tragic but familiar story I'm never going to be the person that I want to be that I know I can be and have the relationship and so I think it's really that very powerful that's why it's so hard because as you said even though we don't like that home it's where our identity it's it's all we know so when we're faced with letting go of it um it's it's terrifying right but yet essential and one of the things that therapists often encounter, and I can give you uh, kind of a, an illustration of it, is, is if, if a, uh, a young uh, girl comes home from school and is greeted, in quotes, by a drunken, underwear-clad, unshaven uh, father who hurdles a beer bottle at her as she walks in the door, and that's only because he's so intoxicated that he misses. And every night she prays to the fairy godmother, please make things different. Please put a little land abuse in my father's orange juice, as it were. And, uh, well, the fairy godmother finally listens. Uh, She comes home from school that day, and there is a clean-shaven, sober, dressed, warm welcoming everything she wanted dad to be. What does she do? Well, the first thing she does is walk outside and check the address. This is not home. Right. Then the next thing, and this is something therapists see repeatedly, whether it's with spouses who have complained about the behavior of their uh, spouse or children, they begin to agitate to return the situation to the familiar. 
So having what we want is very different than wanting it. We can want it, but actually having it is a whole new and different experience. That's so. That's, that's such a great. I, I love that. Right, like you, and that's what women do. They'll be like, I want a qual. I want a really quality, kind, amazing guy. Uh, and just on a call the other night, we had these women and they're talking, Dr. Cardner, about these men that adore them. They're pursuing them. They want to really connect with them. And a lot of them, what they're struggling with is it's like it feels too much, right? Like they're scared to be with. They don't know what to do. Um, and it feels too much to actually be treated the way they want to treat be treated. So that's exactly what's happening. Exactly. And uh, the idea that uh, there are many examples of. Uh, have been given. Jay Haley often talked about his paradoxic instructions. Uh, a woman who complains, like bringing her husband to the principal's office, complaining that uh, you got you got to get this drunk sober. I can't stand living with him any longer. If he doesn't sober up, uh, I'm going to leave him. And uh, uh, what do the what has that woman done frequently in the past? She stopped on the way home and at the liquor store and brought home liquor just in case we have company we want to offer them a drink. So she becomes an enabler or a codependent in creating a situation she cannot stand, does not want, and does not realize it's exactly what she needs. And I use that term need to refer to the leftover conflict from the past that we are stuck with having to deal with and try to pretend it doesn't exist, the old script. And uh, so we keep putting energy and returning to it like that survivor holding on desperately to the driftwood. And we keep going back to it as if it still is what keeps us alive and keeps us afloat. Mm. You know, so when you were saying that, I just had my own epiphany, as I do whenever I talk to you or read your book, which I've read more than once. You know, I was thinking my well, my trigger is always like, I'm not important, right? And I know where it came from. My dad traveled a lot when I was young. He was a great dad when he was there. It was like very, quote unquote, functional, but he just wasn't there, right? And so my trigger is I'm not important. And I was just thinking that's a pattern that I do with my husband, right? Like every time when I get kind of bossy and snappy, it's like because I'm recreating creating that need to feel important, right? And so it's so powerful how even when we're not aware or it doesn't look like, you know, I'm pushing men away or I'm sabotaging, we have these chains and they just show up by creating that same situation again and again and again. So it's it's pretty crazy how we, how we do that consciously and unconsciously. Absolutely, and I, I think that so often, one of the, one of the, so often people will come, couples that I may see, uh, talking about, well, I don't think there's anything survivable about this relationship. There's nothing that we can work on, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, I, my, that may be, and that, that that may be how you evolve. But what I think is crucial, and let's focus on, and I think all of us, all three of us, can agree that let's look at how you got to where you are today. What were the factors that drew you together, because one of the things that people have difficulty understanding, and I am thoroughly convinced of of, in the work that I've done uh, with couples, is that we always marry our emotional twin, that the circumstances of the life of the other person, one could be from poverty, one from wealth, it doesn't matter. The dynamic, the idea of what it is, the script of what home represents, is going to be an identical, so that they we're drawn to the familiar. Here is someone, unconsciously we usually are saying to ourselves, here is someone who understands the profundity of my most painful experience, and therefore could understand me and help me, but also is the person who knows exactly which buttons to push to recreate it and keep it going. That's, so yeah. uh, the, the, the idea that we have couples of trying to help them and to realize the important thing about our marriage is what we learn about ourselves because our spouse holds up a mirror and we get to see a reflection that we don't ordinarily see or pay attention to. 
And that's the value of our marriage is to understand ultimately not only the closeness and understanding our spouse, but ultimately understanding what we've not understood about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I think what you're describing is that you're aware there are times in the interaction with your spouse that you become aware of something that indeed harkens back to that early script. And of course, uh, that is exactly the essence of what we create in our relationships. Someone once said, uh, marriage, and I think it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful keep it by it, marriage is a new battlefield upon which we wage battles from the past, hoping this time we'll win. Mm, I love that's that. The, that's the cruel hoax that, of course, the name of the game was we, lo- we lost. And the only way you can win a game called You Lose is not to continue to play it in some different way, because the name of the game is You Lose. So the only way to win a game called You Lose is not to play. And that means letting go of the driftwood if I go back to that image. Oh, my gosh. This is amazing. Okay, this is going to be like also Your episodes are probably going to be the top two for a while. This was so good. Okay, I have a, one question before we wrap up, and it's a, it's a strategy one. So what do you do um, when you recognize, you know, that you're having that childhood need um, that's not getting met as an adult, and you want intimacy, you want connection, um, what can you do when it's coming up and you are awake to it and you want to be optimized so that you can move through these things more easily? I think there are four steps. The first is, what's the name of the game? And by that, I don't mean a, a game in a facetious sense. I mean the idea of what's the nature of the conflict that my partner and I are enmeshed in. What is that? That's, I think, so important to put a name to it because and I often when I lecture, I will tease an audience by saying, what's the first task? And I don't mean this in a profound theologic sense. I just think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the meaning of the story is so profound. What's the first task God asks of Adam? Well, the first, and very rarely in all the years I've given the lecture and teased with that question, have I ever gotten anybody to answer? So they slept through their Sunday school class, but the, the first thing that God asked Adam is name the animals, because when you put a name to something, you begin to take control of it. You begin to have not fear blindly of it, but you begin to have a sense of mastery. So what's the name of the game? What is the nature of the conflict that we are embroiled in? That is the the emerging of our my spouse and my script. What is that? Secondly, how do we continue to play that game? That's so important to recognize. What are we doing that maintains it? A tire that rolls down the road keeps rolling only by virtue of putting a hand on it and continuing to give it momentum. So what's the name of the game? How are we continuing to play it, even though it's not what we want? It is what we've needed. The third step is quitting. So name of the game, how do we play it? Quitting. Identifying how we maintain that game and then stopping it. Mm. That's a profound step. Why? Because it's the orphaning step. It means that for the first time, regardless of how old, I've worked with people in their 70s who have been married uh, 50-some years. The moment they stop the game, they've left home for the first time. And I mean their parental home, when they stop maintaining that past script that came from home and childhood. And fourth is beginning to do something new and different. And I liken that to learning how, and I'm a terrible dancer, so Mm -hmm. learning how to dance. If you're not awkward, stilted, uncomfortable, uh, unfamiliar, you're not doing something new and different. And I think that that becomes the, the, or like a language. If you don't stumble looking for words in a new language, you ain't learning a new language. If you fall back on the old, it's not struggling with acquiring the new. And those are the four steps, I think, that are important for people to to uh, risk going through. Uh, so people often can name the game, can recognize how they may be playing it. Yeah, it's too bad. Sorry I did that. 
But stopping it is that profound step of letting go of the past. Mm. And then the first step of embracing the present and the new. That's so, you know, it's so my husband and I um, went to this couple's retreat um, through the Hoffman Institute in October. And so we learned this word, uh, t- a twinge. So this is something that he does. We call it a twinge. So we named it, right? Like we came up with like our little twinge things that we totally know are stuff from the past. So we're like, oh, I'm having a twinge. And we discussed what like our top 10 were. Um, and so we realized like what we do that we keep doing it because then we just both get bossy and nasty. Um, and then we stopped it. And that's what's really amazing is Um, And I think John Gottman calls it like repair, right? Like a, right. Like a little, like, you know, he'll be like, are, you know, make like, make a little funny, right. Or like you okay or something. And so we realized now we can name that repair. I'm like, oh, that's a repair. This is where I stop it and do something different. (laughs) And it's been so powerful from going through those steps. And what's amazing is then the next time it's not feeling like a twinge. So it, it's kind of brilliant to take awareness and then put it into action. And without that... Yeah, what I love about what you, you just said about twinge is it sounds so much like twib. Uh, it exactly, the twinge is the twinship. So the, the tinge ship is the twin ship. Wow. That's the point at which there is a collusion in, from the past with our partner that maintains something maladaptive. So a twinge is a twin. <laughs> well, we got we got we, we got we to gotta, we gotta take this on the road more, you and I. Like the twinge and the twin, that's brilliant. I never I never thought of that. That's so cool. So last qu- quick question. Um, is it ever possible to break a chain completely so that it doesn't happen again? I get asked this question all the time. Yeah, no, I, th- I think what's important is the... The issue under stress, we all fall back in terms of the int- the only issue is for how long and how intense. So people who think that, okay, I've gotten rid of my past, I recognize the twinge, if we call it that, or twinship, and I've repaired it. Does that mean it will never happen again? Of course not. It will happen under stress of situations, and it's a a recognition ourselves and our partner that, yes, under stress, we may fall back to an old position. And again, the only issue is it's fine, it's perfectly okay, it's understandable, but for how long and how intense? That is the uh, only question that we have to uh, demand of ourselves is to make it as short as possible with the least amount of intensity. And understanding what it's about is what helps us do that. The other thing that helps us is with our partner, it's always helpful to keep one adult present at all times. Mm. So uh, if our partner doesn't get sucked into reinforcing, as you were saying, the mutuality that could be recognized, so if you were to have fallen back because of some stress you've experienced, and the partner then having a point in the present that you're moored to and that you don't find yourself free-falling into the past, and so I think that the, the idea of our past is always with us. And what I like to analogize it to is we can often remember the address or the street or what the house looked like when we were kids. What was Where did we live? Well, I, I lived on Webb Avenue when I was seven years old. Oh, okay. I don't quite recall the number right now. Uh, but that address, that part of me is always with me. Mm -hmm. But I just don't live there anymore. But occasionally I might find myself drawn back to that Webb Street, W-E-B-B, was the name of that first street that I'm aware of as a kid. And sure, that's always an old address that I did live at. I just don't live there anymore, but it'll always be part of me. And as under stress, I may find myself back on Webb Avenue. And the issue is, okay. That's not where I live anymore. Let me find my way back to the present address. Wow. That's amazing. I love that. Mine was Indian Hill Road, in case anyone is thinking. I wonder what Marnie's address was. Indian Hill Road in Iowa. Um, That's amazing. Thank you so much for coming back. I will absolutely always invite you on this show. You are 
so amazing. I think that anyone who is studying this field is so lucky to be mentored and taught by you. And I'm so grateful for your book and your work and for being here. And I just appreciate you so much, Dr. Gardner. Let me tell you that it is absolutely uh, reciprocal. I am so appreciative of the opportunity to share the thoughts with you. Uh, Awesome. So, ladies, here we laid it out for you. So now, don't forget, go out and date with dignity. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.